You're most likely watching this YouTube live because you're interested in how the Perpetual Wealth Code works if you're making a loan to a business or for an investment purpose. We're going to be talking exactly about that today because it's very important for you to understand that there are documentations that you need to have in place to make sure that if you're ever audited that you are um, going to pass that audit with flying colors. And John, you've done quite a bit of uh, documentation and research with people that have been in audits. Yes, we sure have. And uh, you've always been able to bring those people out with flying colors as regards to interest claimed on a deduction for a business or an investment. And that's really important that we have that documentation. Now, to be fair, a lot of people say, well, isn't the Perpetual Wealth Code just like the infinite banking or bank on yourself or numerous other things? And and like I said, to be fair, I would say that the infinite banking is the basis of the Perpetual Wealth Code in that we use it and that concept, but we go beyond that and build the required documentation to make this very easy to track and very easy for you to perpetuate that wealth, not only throughout your life, but to the next generation as well. That's right. So let's take a look at uh, the, uh, the way that you need to start thinking about this if you're a business owner or an investor and you want to manage your cash flow by borrowing from a bank. Now we're going to start with the bank because a lot of people use banks in order to finance investments or to finance a business. And so in this situation, you would get a paycheck or you would have a source of income and that income then would uh, go to a bank. And um, you would put that, deposit that into the bank. And then when you need money, because your money's in the bank, you would go to the bank to get the money. And the bank may loan you your own money or it might loan you someone else's money. But in essence, what's happening here is your money is under the control of the bank. It's no longer under your control. And so now you spend that money for an investment in your business or you, um, you, you spend it on expenses in your business and you've got to pay back that loan to the bank. And so you begin to do that over short uh, little payments over time and eventually you pay that loan back with interest. And then your paycheck that was deposited at the bank, you can either withdraw it or you can write checks on it, but that money, as you can see, gets dispersed to other places. It doesn't stay in your control anymore. It's outside your control. Now, what happens long-term tax-wise here is that your business still gets to deduct the interest that your business pays the bank. That's a known fact. That's why Warren Buffett says it's always better to build equity with other people's money. This is a known fact in the investment world. And that gets listed on your K-1 statement if you're in a partnership or, you, or you're in an LLC or you're filing like an S-Corp. And so um, that interest is like an, a, a deduction from what your, your business or your investment earns. So you never pay taxes on that. But at the same time, there's, the bank gets that interest and you don't get a profit from it. But from their growth on the interest they charged you and other lenders, they pay you a little bit of interest and the interest that you earn, you have to list on your 1040 as income on a 1099 form, and you get taxed on that interest earnings. Now, let's go back through this, only this time, let's switch the players. Let's manage money by leveraging your participating whole life insurance policy for a business or investment purpose. Again, we've got the pol this time we've got a life insurance company and that life insurance company issues you a participating whole life insurance policy that builds cash value. Uh, sometimes that happens more quickly than others, depending on how your policy was written, depending on your age, your health and your risk factors. But then we've got to have the other two players as well. We've got to have a bank or in this case, not a bank, but a money management account that you control that you manage so that the bank isn't gonna collect all the profits on this. I'm gonna jump in right here because this money manager account, it's taking the place of the bank. It is. In the, in the equation we just looked at here. This money manager account is very important for tracking 
on a business loan. So you wanna pay attention to this money manager account. It's at the center, you see that here. So this money manager account, not only is it important for tracking uh, for the interest deduction, but it's important for your tracking as well so you don't mix up the funds that you're managing now instead of the bank managing. Well, we know that the middle person in, in any transaction usually is the one that is making the most because they have the least amount of risk and they're making the profits on it. So right. we want to place ourselves, yourself, in the middle. So this money management account can be a bookkeeping entry that you take or it can actually be a separate checking account that you use a local bank so that they do your books for you and um, they'll record the ins and outs and, and that makes it a lot easier for you to uh, do the accounting on this. Yeah, you have it all in one statement. Even, even when you take it into the accounting software, if you have it all in one account, it's easier to know what that account is for it at is. the end of the year. And all the inflows and outflows for it, much easier to track it that way. Now, so if you can always... use a separate, separate checking account for this money management account, that's usually the best way to go. Uh, or it can just be done bookkeeping wise if you're just doing a few loans here and there. Now, we used to have two money management accounts, one for business and investment and one for our personal use. And that's really redundant. You don't need to do that. You can just have one account that records all the, 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 the deposits that the insurance company is going to put in your managing account. And we call it a deposit because that's exactly what you did with your paycheck to the bank. But in actuality, it's a leveraged loan against your cash value or your uh, paid up insurance. And so the insurance company is the one that gives you that money from their general account. They don't take your money and give it to you. So a misnomer uh, in the infinite banking concept world and the bank on yourself world is that why would you want to borrow your own money? And people ridicule that. And the truth of the matter is, is you're not. Mm -hmm. You are not. You are, your money continues to grow in that policy at the internal rate of return that was guaranteed plus any dividends that the insurance company is going to share with you. This becomes very important. It becomes more like a, an interest swap, like banks do all the time for five basis points or two basis points or something like that because they can make money doing that or save money doing that. So this is really critical that you understand that it's, it's not your money that you're borrowing. It's the insurance company's money that they're loaning to you by leveraging your cash value. So now it comes into your management. You're now the one that's got to decide what to do with that. And so you decide to loan it to your business or to make an investment with. Your business or the investment can go ahead and use that money and it disappears. But now either from the investment proceed or from the business, you've got to pay it back just like you pay the loan back to the bank. That can take as long as you want to because now you're the one in charge of this loan because you're the middleman. You don't have to uh, go by the predetermined factors of the bank. You can set the terms that you want to. That's right. You get to set the interest rate. You get to set how long you're going to take to repay it. You do want to at least pay the interest rate back that the insurance company is going to charge sure. you for the money. Just like a bank would at least charge the interest rate that they have to pay to the people saving the money that put the money in the bank in the first place. But this amount of control is so critical for a business or an investment because an investment might not turn profitable for several months or several years while you have this ongoing loan from the life insurance company. That gives you the control of someone else's money for an extended period of time and that allows you to build the equity that you need in your business or your investment. And so you get to determine that. You can even change it in the midst of, of the loan if you want to uh, by just adjusting how you're going to uh, reimburse your money management account. And then eventually you want that money to flow back to the insurance company. And it can go back at however of a frequency you want. Again, this is something under your control. So make these payments affordable, make them comfortable because uh, there's no sense in sweating this. It's your time you make the most of it and uh, time is money as we all know. Now the difference with this is all that money went back to the insurance company and to be in, instead of being dispersed and so what's going to happen here is a difference in how this money is taxed as well. Again your business or the investment still gets to list the interest that it had to pay the, the middleman here, the bank, your money manager's account, you, it still gets to deduct that interest as if it never made it because it's an interest charge and the IRS still recognizes that. So that's a deduction, goes on your K-1 statement. 
And th then what happens is the next days is that you have to report that income because you're the middleman on a 1099 interest form so that the IRS knows that that money was accounted for as income to you and what kind of income it was. So the K-1 and the 1099 here kind of just wash each other out. There's really no uh, charge here one way or the other. It's, mm -hmm. uh, but then what happens is you pay that uh, interest back on the loan to the insurance company. That is when you get something special. And that is you get to deduct that interest you paid to them because this was a business risk or an investment risk. You get to pay the interest, uh, put the interest on um, your Schedule A, 10, 1040 Schedule A, as an expense, uh, an investment risk. And that then becomes a personal tax deduction for you instead of a business deduction for you as it was if you borrowed it from a bank. Now, all this while, remember, you weren't using your money. You were using the insurance company's money. Your money that you paid for your paid up insurance and your policy, your cash value, is still growing at the guaranteed internal rate of return that the contract promised, and you've been able to collect any dividends that the insurance company has shared with you from the time you took the loan out until you paid it back. It didn't change that, and those dividends are tax deferred until the time that you would withdraw them. Obviously, there's never going to be a, a taxation on a loan because that's not the way our IRS code works. So, John, um, you've gone, like we said earlier, into depth on all the documents that the IRS is looking when we're doing a business or investment loan. Yes. And that's so much different than a personal loan because IRS doesn't care if I take money out of one pocket and put it in the other. When, and that's what's happening when I give myself a personal loan. That's in right. fact, as a personal loan uh, would work just like this, only we would be where the, your business here is on this slide. Mm -hmm. um, you would be there and you would, you would be all three of these entities. Right. And so um, it's really just a systematic way of helping you save more without really feeling the crunch of keeping more of the money you make. Right. Now, there is a case where uh, on a personal loan, you would like want to track it like a business loan. Sure. And that is if it is is in, if in place of this business you had an investment instead that you were making mm -hmm. personally, we well, still want that tracking in place Absolutely. because then you can still get that deduction on the interest that you paid to the insurance company. What you're seeing on the left hand side there, uh, that interest deduction there. And even if we're not tracking it for the interest deduction, if you're not keeping records, you don't know what's going on. So it's always a good idea to track these loans, whether they're business, whether they're for an investment, whether you're making a micro or macro loan to somebody else, or whether you're doing it just for paying off your credit cards or for financing a vacation or something personal. Because if you don't keep track of it, you won't know what's happening and nobody else will either. Mm -hmm. That's right. So let's switch, switch gears here for a second and let's move over to um, talk about a little bit when would a business owner want to use a policy loan for financing something? Oh, wow, that's a good question. That's a, and you know, one of the, I can think of one thing right away is in business, if you're an entrepreneur on business, you never know what money is going to come in this month. Never. Sure. Because, you know, I, I remember years ago people saying, well, I'm on a fixed budget. And I said, boy, I wish I was. You know, <laughs> I, I'd know exactly what's coming in, you know. Yeah. But people that are in business don't. We have accounts receivable. We have accounts payable. Accounts payable are always constant. But accounts receivable, we don't know when those accounts are actually going to be received. Mm -hmm. And so um, having a, like this personal line of credit and a policy is a huge advan um, advantage. Uh, excuse me, it's very advantageous mm -hmm. for a business owner, oh, regardless certainly. of whether they're big, small, or gigantic, because yeah. this type of cash flow is exactly what Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos do with of their free cash flow. It's just that we don't have the big reserves that they do, but we're managing it the same way they right. do. Right. So, so first of all, uh, as a reserve, that's obviously important. Uh, and that a reserve is important for businesses that are seasonal, yard care businesses, sure. farming businesses, businesses that need to purchase equipment. That can mm -hmm. create an artificial, an artificial season yes. in that business where they need money to cover that financing for either developing a product, financing equipment, you right. name to it. To expand. Yeah. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Or just this reserve to cover accounts receivable, 
um, a reserve is always a good thing or to have. Or just marketing. Just you marketing. Know, if, if we know that if it's going to be, a good, it's going to be mm -hmm. a good idea to do that marketing, then uh, you can use uh, a policy loan for that as well. Sometimes uh, business owners will ask us, well, should I take a policy loan to cover um, you know, everyday expenses in my business, the payroll, the, um, the operating costs just to keeping my business running? Oftentimes these will be people, even like business consultants, that don't have very much equipment that they need to purchase. Maybe they're working from a laptop computer at home um, and you, you have one or two employees, maybe a very, very minimal output. So does it make sense to finance recurring expenses and how often? Well, it can. It's just like if uh, taking a personal loan to pay for my credit card balance at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. I have to realize that I can't do that indefinitely because uh -huh. otherwise, um, you know, everybody would be running off credit. And yeah. it wouldn't matter whether we were doing it out of a policy loan or off of a bank loan off of our credit card. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, is we can do short spurts of that just to help us save more capital. Right. To change the, the, the way cash flow is happening from away from us back to us. Uh -huh. And what it is, is it's a forced way of systematically saving. And people say, well, I could do that without all going through all this. But we know in business, and you know in your business, without a system, it doesn't happen. <laughs> and this is the system that makes it happen. So for short time periods, yes, absolutely. Take small business loans, maybe to finance payroll in a short period, mm -hmm. or maybe even just the time just to say, hey, I want to force myself to save a little bit extra here. Certainly. So this is a, a kind of a visual way to look at it. Financing expenses absolutely gives you more cash flow as you start into this process. Definitely. So take a look at this. If these blue lines represent loans that you're taking, you know, the amount of the loans, and we staggered them in time to represent this, the top half of this, this is like cash flow, the money that would be in your pocket as you start taking loans to finance operating costs that you normally would have paid directly out of income. Mm -hmm. So you have green cash flow here. The other part of this is going to be repayments in the red that you see here. Now, these repayments, they could be coming out of your operating cash flow as well. It's going to be coming from your income one way or another. But either way, you've covered your operating costs during there. You, the green is cash flow that's in your pocket that you can do something with at the front end of this uh, setup here. Mm -hmm. Now, if we say this is like six, seven months in here, notice the bar that is fully red down here at the bottom. This is where the repayments have completely caught up with the amount that you're borrowing to cover those ongoing uh, expenses every month. At this point, and it, it doesn't matter whether we're six months in, whether we're two years in, however you set the term on these repayments, that's yes. going to be when you're going to see the crossover point right here. Six months, two years, whenever that is. And hopefully you've used the money in the first to generate more cash flow so that it covers that. That's exactly. the purpose in this loan in the first place. So that's managing cash flow wisely. So if you take two more loans, all right, the red is going to outpace. So that's where the forced savings that you talked about comes in. It's a way to, for you to force the business to save more, but there's still an interest cost to that, sure isn't there? there? Is. And so even if you stop this, you're going to have the tapering trail of repayments that continue then for the next six months, two years, or however long these loans work. Sure. So like you were saying, the key here is to make this cash flow produce enough to cover the higher expenses on the tail end. And the thing is here, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. If we hadn't stopped taking loans here, mm -hmm. then these long red bars would have discontinued mm -hmm. and we would have never been able to catch back up. Right. It's just like any other type of debt that you assume. You only go into debt to purchase, purchase assets or to or advance to buy your time. business. Or to buy time. <laughs> yes. And if you're just buying time by buying time, <laughs> yes, pretty <laughs> soon the pipe has to be never paid. Ending loop. Exactly. Yes. So that's the, uh, that's the cash flow picture that you can think about as you're deciding whether it makes sense to take a business loan and what your strategy is for doing that. Now, let's look at some of the documentation behind the scenes. And this is where, the, uh, where, where it comes into play where I've been able to help people that were going through audits who needed to, uh, to make sure their books were up to speed. These are the elements that need to be in order for this, you know, these business loans. And as you watch John go through this, it may seem that this is really complicated, but it's really actually very simple. But just because it's simple doesn't make it easy. Einstein actually said that. And 
what we need to do is to uh, have a system to keep track of this so that everything is kept up to date. There's no last minute rushing around when there's an audit. Mm -hmm. And um, then things just go real smoothly. So this is really important because we've talked with uh, tax attorneys, we've talked to CPAs, and this is the information that the IRS is looking and the audits that you've helped other people go through, John. And none of our clients, they were always with some other um, agency that was, that was not teaching the perpetual wealth code. Or how to document it. How to document it. Yeah. Then what happens is they get to a point where they get to knock on the door from the IRS and they go, oh, what do I do? I've got all these loans that I've never documented, but I've been claiming all this interest. So just watch this. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. um, and and just through. follow the strategy. You know, some of this, some of the details that we're going to go through, this is actually work that's going to be done by your accountant. So as long as you get the documentation in or order, you have those details. Um, you, you may do the amortization schedules, you may hire somebody to do that, but whatever, what, as long as you have the documentation, your accountant will have what they need uh, at the end of the year. That's a really good point because this documentation gives your accountant what he needs. He doesn't even know, need to know what you're doing or why this interest expense happened. These documents will give them the tools to fill out your, your uh, tax returns properly so that you get the credit for that interest. So here we go. So you have the insurance company, the money manager account, the business checking account. You recognize these from the last, uh, from what, what dad covered earlier. We have the loan from the insurance company to your money manager account. This is a personal checking account. This is a loan to you personally. Then you turn around, you lend it to your business. So now you have two loans, one from the insurance company to you, one from you to your business. You're gonna have repayments on each of those loans. And to track those repayments, you need an amortization schedule, one for each loan. And you also need some documents over here on the right-hand side, promissory note, minutes, meeting notice of waiver, or waiver notice of special meeting. You see those, these documents over here on the right-hand side. And that's really just proper um, bookkeeping for any business. It is. I mean, these forms have to be filled out for other things too. If you're running your LLC or your S Corp or your C Corp properly or your partnership, and if you're not doing this, then um, if you're ever audited or sued, then you might find out that you're really a sole proprietor or just a partnership because if these kind of documents aren't kept, that's what allows uh, the veil of a corporation or a partnership to be pierced. Exactly. And yeah. So, so, so this, this is, is partly this legal is, protection as well, so that you're keeping an arm's length transaction whenever you deal with your business. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you can go back in time and catch up the accounting and document. Oh, this money was for this. Yes. Even if you didn't do it right then, but the uh, the the corporate documents. That's something you want to keep in order along with that, and it's best to do it as you do it, so that way you never have to catch up. Makes it so much easier. Yeah. So you can find this uh, overview chart on moneytools.net. Ben, my brother, is running the chat, so he's going to put the link to the, loan, the Money Tools Learning Center where you can access this business loan layout. It's one of the links in the sidebar. You'll be able to access that there. If you have any questions as we go through this process, go ahead and put them into the chat box and we'll answer them as we have time or at the end of the YouTube Live here. So take this flow. Each of the repayments on both loans that you have going here, they're going to be composed of principal and interest. The amortization schedule will break that down payment by payment. You'll see that here in a little bit. But if we look at each of these schedules, you get to decide the interest rate now that your business is going to pay you back. There's a question mark uh, on the interest rate on this loan. It has to be something reasonable. You don't want to be outrageous with your company. Sure. Uh, the IRS does have some guidelines on that. You'll see that in the footnote on the, uh, the layout that you download from the Money, Man uh, the Money Tools website. Some other things that you need to consider. Are you going to pay, is your business going to pay you interest or are you going to take a shareholder distribution for the amount of interest that the business would have paid you? Some, these are taxed a little bit differently. Sometimes you'll want to take one, sometimes the other. Yeah, so maybe so, something you should talk to your accountant about. So what's the advantage, let's say that the insurance company is charging us 5% and, our, and we charge our business 5%. What would be the advantage of doing that loan? It's the same interest rate. Right. So you're going to get a deduction on either side. You will get a tax deduction for the interest rate the insurance company is charging. We'll get to that here in a second. Sure. But the, um, the, the main reason that people might want to consider doing the shareholder distribution 
over the interest is if the distribution is going to be taxed less. So what you're saying, John, it. is that if the insurance company is charging 5% and I just want to charge my business 5% to make that bookkeeping easy, I could actually take a distribution for another 3% and the loan would actually be an 8% loan an to my 8% business. An 8% loan, exactly. But then we avoid some complications with taxes and whatnot, and right? This 3.8% this net tax on net, in, or tax on, I think it's a surtax, they call it, on net investment income. That's what ma mainly what people are trying to avoid is they're structuring this sure. uh, percentage right here. And that is something that your accountant fills out on form 8960, I believe it mm -hmm. is. You'll see that here in a minute. Another thing uh, with interest deductions, the rules can be different for businesses with gross receipts over $25 million. If you have a business that's bringing in over $25 million, you might need to look at some of those different rules. But generally speaking, you get to set the uh, interest rate on this loan wherever you like as you consider these things. On the other side, the loan between you and the insurance company. Now, this one you don't get to set the rate on. The insurance company has already mm -hmm. set it for you. So I'm gonna put 5% just as an example mm -hmm. on this. Different insurance companies have different rates. Two things you wanna consider as you look at the rate here. The insurance company will generally compound their interest annually. So when you set up the amortization schedule or somebody does it for you, you wanna select the annual compounding option. Another thing that you can consider is the interest charged in advance or quoted in advance or in arrears? Mm -hmm. Most amortization schedules will automatically be in arrears. If you don't see where it says, then they're calculating in arrears. Many insurance companies quote an uh, interest rate that is in advance. Yes. So you can simply do, do a calculation, adjust it, or if you don't know what it is, just contact us and we'll be able to tell you. Now looking at this, this chart here, John, the question always comes up, should my business own the policy or should I own it personally? And I think this, this flow shows that we want to have the money manager account ourselves in the middle yes. of the business and the source of capital. And Many so, times. Because otherwise we lose this deduction personally over here on this interest that we're paying back to the insurance company. Yeah. Now, yeah. at times it may make sense for a business to own a policy like on an employee mm -hmm. or a key, person, a key person or a, an executive. Uh, those are special um, situations and there's still ways to access that money and use it inside the business, but to keep track of it would be different than this. Certainly it would be, yes. And, and let's talk about the, some of those different options like the buy-sell agreement and the uh, key person policy. We'll talk about that here in a little bit once we're finished going through the loan section sure. because those are some, some other options that business owners have to utilize life insurance in their planning. Yes. So right now you're owning the policy personally and many times this, this is what people want anyway because the reserve now is working for them in their personal policy. It will be there for their retirement or their passive yes. income someday. Um, and it's not just sitting doing nothing in the business. That's correct. Because every, everyone needs that reserve, whether it's a line of credit at a bank, mm -hmm. with the, which they would pay for, whether it's money just sitting in the business doing nothing, mm -hmm. or why not have it working for you. So that's, that's what we're doing here. Uh, the payment amount on this second amortization will be the same payment amount as the one that you set the interest rate on. Now let's say you set the interest rate at 8%. This loan's at 5%. What's going to happen to this schedule if the payment amount is the same every month? Well, if you pay that loan off and the policy was written at the MEC limits to begin with, you could, if you put all that 8% and all the principal back into the insurance company's mm -hmm. loan repayment, then you could cause your policy to become a modified endowment contract. And we don't want that. Because the extra 3% that you're paying back uh, once that loan is completely paid off, is going to be considered extra premium. And if your policy was written as it should have been, that extra 3% could make it become a modified endowment contract. So you, that's what the money manager's account is for, is to hold that extra interest because the policy, um, the insurance company doesn't need that interest or they would have asked for it, and your policy may not hold it as a premium payment. And so, Keeping it in the money manager's account lets you keep control of that money. You can use it just like any other loan you would take out of the money management account. You could still charge interest for it. You could still use it for an investment or a business purpose or a personal loan. But uh, you're protecting yourself and your policy from becoming a modified endowment contract and facing taxation. 
Yes. So when you do this and the payment amount's the same, the way you're going to see this happen in, in life is you're, you're, the payments, you, this schedule, the, the schedule on the left between you and the insurance company will be paid off early. The resulting amount of money will sit, sit and stay in the money manager account. It can't go to the policy yet or it would be that modified endowment contract that you and I think about. it's important to address this issue too that the insurance company doesn't even recognize that you're paying back more interest until the loan is paid off. Mm -hmm. They just think that you're accelerating the loan payment. And so um, you won't see this happening, like I said, until all the principal's paid back on that loan and then you're trying to put that extra th little <laughs> bit of money in there. It doesn't it, fit. It doesn't fit. <laughs> it doesn't so. fit. That's right. So uh, this is the Learning Center, the link that Ben gave you in the money tool in the chat box, the Money Tools Learning Center. Um, there are some resources on here that you'll find valuable. There's also a link you can sign up for a free trial on the Money Tools uh, website so you can uh, get all these tools that we're going to talk about here. For a basic business loan setup, look at video number four on the uh, Learning Center and audio files number five and six. So once you watch the video of how the business loan is set up, listen to the audios as you do it. and They'll walk you through the process step by step and you don't have to have more than one screen, more than one thing on the screen as you're trying to listen to everything. If you're doing a line of credit setup, and we haven't talked about the line of credit yet, but you, if you're lending money to your business, you can get quite a few loans going in a sure. fairly short period of time, depending on your business needs. Sometimes it's easier to set up a line of credit so you don't have the tracking and the, the paperwork on each and every one. You can combine it all together on one a loan called the line of credit. The video for that is video number nine. And then when you're coming to around, you need to get the interest totals for your accountant at the end of the year. You're going to be looking at video number six and maybe video number three. If your payments got off track during the year, you need to make the amortization match what actually happened. Yeah. So those are the, those are some of the resources on the learning center that you'll be starting with. Let's look at an example of how this would look set up in the software, what your amortization schedules are going to look like. Very concise charts that are there that will be there if you're ever audited to show the payments, the times you met it, and all this is set up by you, your mm -hmm. time, uh, your time frame. You make it affordable and comfortable for yourself. Like John said earlier, at least you need to pay the interest that the insurance is going to charge you for a year. But this could be an interest-only loan for a certain period of time, sure could. Uh, depending on what your business needs or how your investment is turning out. Uh, you get to control that. That's just one more reason to use the perpetual wealth code instead of conventional financing. That's right. So on the left, you have the loan between you and the insurance company. On the right, the one between you and the business. Let's look at the one between you and the business a little closer. You can see very quickly that whatever name you give the loan will be there. This is a loan from Joe Example to his company at 8% interest. You see a few more details about the loan down here, and then you see a breakdown of each and every payment, the interest in the principal, and the remaining balance. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy there. Notice that that payment is $630. And note that down. We'll come back to that here in a second. At the end of the year, when your accountant wants to know how much interest did your business pay to you last year, you can find that really quickly. Here's the one, the line for 2019. It's a different color. You can see the total interest was $390 and four cents. Exactly so, what your accountant needs. So John, why did we, you come up with this software? Because, you know, we were using other software and it was keeping track of it, but... Uh, it was harder to use. There were so many clicks to get in, so many clicks to get out. And we had to and print everything to keep document files in case we yes. were audited. And so all of this is kept electronically. Correct. Securely. You can keep it on the cloud. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and it's so much easier. Or you to can print out up. copies if, you're still, uh, if you still want those paper files. You can print off a sure. copy and stow it away. Mm -hmm. But yes, you have it that way. You can also save it as a PDF, whatever works best for you. Your accountant's going to use this $390 to put in the interest deduction for your business on the K-1, to send you the 1099 for your interest income, and then also on your 1040 and the, the uh, oh, sure, 8960 to report that income that came in on the 1090. Right. Nine form. Okay. The 8960 form, that's the one for the 3.8% surtax, may mm -hmm. not apply to everybody, but generally speaking, that's what you're looking for. Now, here's the business loan on the insurance company side. Notice the interest rate is different. See, so this 5 is a 5% right the, there. This is a loan between the money manager 
and the insurance, and the insurance company. company. Exactly. So the insurance company sets this rate. You'll also notice down here that the compounding frequency is annual. That's the mm -hmm. way the insurance company is compounding the loan. You still have the payment breakdown right here, but you're going to see less interest per payment on this one because the interest rate is lower. This is the loan that would be paid off earlier. And you can set this for interest charge in the in front and insurance charge in the rears, right? Um, that one, for, for that you adjust the interest rate input. And okay. so if you have questions about what your company, if your company is quoting you an interest rate in advance, then contact us, we can change it to uh, rears for you or you can look up and find the, the calculation on how to do it yourself online, but, or, or we can do it for you, but we'll make that easy. Notice the payment amount though is still $630. That yes. came over from the other schedule. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, you look up the interest totals for your accountant. Notice the interest is less on this one, 237.73. Mm -hmm. This is the interest though that your accountant will give you a tax deduction for personally. Mm -hmm. That shows up on your 1040, 89, 60. So those are the uh, amortization schedules, the numbers side of things, and then you have the documents that we talked about, the promissory note, the corporate mm -hmm. minutes, the waiver notice, a special meeting. Uh, you can do all three of those, all combined using the templates that are provided on the document library. And this part here is not net. only tax protection, it's also legal protection. It is. Because you're keeping yeah, you, you need it for both. Your, your person. You need it for both. And so um, take, using the business loan combo, you're going to download it. It's just like three pages. You can go through it and uh, there's even some macros to make it easier for you to put in the details. If you're doing this often, you can put in your business information into that. So you just have to fill out the information that has changed every time. And that can be handy as well. Now for a line of credit, if you're doing a line of credit, you're not going to be doing the corporate minutes, the promissory note, the uh, waiver of notices, special meeting every single time. Mm -hmm. So what do you do in that case? Well, there's, some, there's a special wording that you can add to your annual minutes for your corporation or your company. This wording is a little bit different generally for an LLC than it would be for a corporation. And, but here's an example of what that would look like. And Ben has those uh, wording examples for LLC and corporation that he can put into the chat box for you online as well. I think you're talking about this. a C corporation, right? Versus uh, an LLC. C, C corporation or S corporation mm -hmm. um, or an LLC. It's just a different type of company. So uh, the, the main changes are like the LLC will have managers, generally sure. speaking, whereas the corporation will have officers. Absolutely. So you're, you're just mm -hmm. changing that wording there. Sure. It essentially says the same thing. All right, so that's the example of the wording you'd put in your corporate minutes. Here's a letter that you requested from our CPA a number of years ago. Let's see, it was, this was 2014. It looks like that letter's dated, so it was five years yes. ago. He talks about um, what comes into play, the different sections of the IRS code here. Mm -hmm. Ben has the link to this letter as well. He can paste that uh, in for you. But he talks about in here how the main thing is the concept of tracing. It is. The money that you took from the, the policy loan, from the insurance company, that money you need to be able to trace it through to you personally. That's another purpose of the money manager account. It traces, you show that coming into your personal account. Then you show it going out of that account to your business. Your business now spends that on a purchase or an expense that would be tax deductible. Yes, and, and if, Jack talks about those codes. Whatever exactly. is a business expense or something that you could expense off in your business, it's justifiable to borrow money for that. Yes. And basically anything you can spend money on in a business that you get to say, hey, I spent this money, I'm not going to be taxed on it in my business, is, is viable for a loan. And you can deduct the interest on it if yes. it's a viable business expense. If it wasn't a, a deductible business expense, then you can't deduct the interest either. That's correct. That's, that's the key there. So Jack talks about that in the letter. Uh, you have the tools to track it with the money tool system, and that's how that side of it works. And of course, Jack is someone that we can confidently um, say knows and understands this because he used to audit the Fortune 500 companies as a tax auditor for 33 years at the IRS. Yeah. So he understands the, the ramifications of what large corporations are doing. And time and time again, he said, these laws were made for big corporations. Everyone should be incorporated because yeah. they should be taking advantage of these laws. Certainly. So the other ways that businesses can use, we, we've covered the business loan pretty extensively here. You know, what needs to be in place for you to document that, to track it, all of that. What about for, um, for, for somebody 
who says, well, what are other ways that I might use life insurance in my business planning? Like the buy-sell agreement. Sure. The, um, well, a buy-sell agreement really isn't a life insurance policy. It's an agreement between um, people that are going to uh, buy out a business. Let's say two partners go into business. They need to have a buy-sell agreement. Fact is, they say you're really not in business until you have a way of exiting the business. And so the buy-sell agreement is, what happens if partner A dies? How do I purchase partners A's family and um, how do I pay off that partner's- Buy their business interest. Uh, his yeah. business, his creditors. How, how do I come up with the money to do that? Well, some people will use a sinking fund money where they'll save out of the business a certain amount and just put it into stocks or bonds or whatnot. But the key here is, is the cheapest way to fund something like that is with life insurance. Because for pennies on the dollars, you can have a death benefit on your partner. You have an insurable interest in them. And if that partner dies, then you can pay off the spouse, you can pay off the family, you can pay off his creditors, and you automatically then own 100% of the business, where otherwise you may be forced to sell the business in order to make that happen. <laughs> um, then there can be key person policies where uh, the business uh, owners agree together that they're going to buy policies on each other. So if there's three partners, then uh, there would be uh, a part, uh, you know, the three poli two policies sold to each partner. So there's mm -hmm. going to be six policies written. And then if one of those partners leaves or decides that they don't want to be in the business anymore or they die, again, there's money to buy out or to replace. Um, that partnership shares without mm -hmm. having to go out. Again, pennies on the dollars, the easiest way to do that is with life insurance. Finally, there's something called a SERP, which is a special executive retirement plan that's being used pretty extensively around the country, whereas the business itself or the corporation buys a policy on an executive or a key person in that company. And they do that in a kind of like a split dollar fashion where they say, okay, we're gonna put this in here. We're either gonna bonus you the money and you pay the taxes on it now, or we're gonna put it in and cover the taxes for you right now, but we hold right to X amount of money in this policy that you can never access. But mm -hmm. when you retire, then um, all that money will be yours and the death benefit can go to either your heirs or we can split it. Part of it can go to the corporation, part of it can go to your family. So there's all different kinds of way that life insurance can really, really help a business owner protect their assets and their equity. And that's really what life insurance is all about, is covering risk. Yeah. Now we have a question coming up. Before we get to that though, I, I want to ask you about this. The, um, the SERP, you know, some people will come to us and say, well, should I set up a SERP for my business? And one of the reasons that you, that may not always be best to do that is because the part that the business owns is still exposed to the business liabilities, right? It is. Now, now that could be, that could be a, a, a downgrade on the, uh, for a small business where you're wanting to keep that, uh, where you're wanting to keep your personal assets protected as much as possible. Obviously it makes sense for a bigger company with sure. more shareholders where it would be harder to access their assets. So that's a consideration and why oftentimes small business owners will own their life insurance personally and then leverage it to their business when the business needs funds like we've been talking about Well, today. SERPs are often used by large corporations like Exxon, Comcast, uh, Bank of America, lots of different banks use them as a way of bonusing a special executive yes. that they don't want to have to do it to all their executives. Because they're considered non-qualified plans, that means they're kind of outside the IRS code as far as the, how you have to treat everybody in the company. For, so for the allows, qualified plans. It yeah. allows you to, to compensate someone with higher skills or maybe um, maybe you disfavor that person and want to get them more money. <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, they're great. They're great tools, and uh, it can work in smaller corporations. You just have to understand that it could remain if the company's buying it and retains the ownership of it. It could be liable for um, a, a, a lawsuit, and those assets yeah. could be dissolved in a judgment. Yeah. So one one reason to own the policies personally. There are some reasons to do it on the business side as well, and we can talk to you more about those on a case by case basis. So if you have questions, be sure to give us a call at seven zero two six six zero seven thousand. Now, a question from Francis here. Uh, Francis, uh, you're saying, is there a way for non U.S. native 
doing business in the United States, for example, selling internationally on Amazon, is there a way for them to benefit from the whole life insurance policy? Um, foreign nationals can be insured in the United States. They have to have either their own business or real estate. They have to have a U.S. bank account. They have to have a, a valid work permit, like a green card or a visa, to be working in the United States. Um, and with that information, um, we have been able to insure foreign nationals. We cannot uh, recruit or try to market to foreign nationals because that's against the insurance regulations. But if you're here in the States or you qualify under those things, we'd be happy to help you. All right. Any other questions that we have on the list for today? I'm not seeing any. So if, if you have further questions, you're welcome to uh, email us or give us a call. Again, the number is 702-660-7000. Any final words for, the, for business owners listening today? You know, I, I would just say that you're in business. Uh, you've already jumped the big hurdles. This stuff is really simple. It's just something that we haven't been taught. But there's no reason why you shouldn't be making your money work three different ways. Buying a death benefit, earning an internal rate of return and dividends while you get to leverage that money and make a profit on it in your business as well, and then get a personal tax deduction for it as well. So, um, you know, it just makes sense once you understand the full circle of events that need to take place to make that a viable option for you and your business. All right, great being with you. It's been uh, fun having you on this YouTube Live. Have a wonderful day.